Hi Year 10 and welcome to lecture number three. In today's lecture we're going to be exploring Beatrice Garland's Kamikaze written in 2013. Just as a reminder about these lectures, remember these lectures are still going to remain in Teams even after you've listened to it for the first time so please don't feel like you have to get everything written down in today's session. I really just want you to take about 20 minutes, maximum half an hour, to just get a good idea of what this poem is about before you come to our lesson and get a few key annotations written down. There's always time to go back and add any more detail if you want to after your lesson and even after that to do some additional revision. Okay, so before we go into any more detailed annotations, let's just recap and think about what this poem is about. The poem Kamikaze opens with a kamikaze pilot setting off on his mission. For those of you that are unsure, a kamikaze pilot were specifically trained pilots and they were used towards the end of World War II. Their job was to fly their planes on a suicide mission into enemy ships. Most famously, those of you that have seen the film or heard about Pearl Harbor, you will know that it was seen as an absolute great honour to serve your country in this way. In this poem, interestingly, the pilot doesn't complete his mission. He turns around, he goes back home. His daughter in the poem imagines that this was because when he was on his mission, when he was on his way to his death, he saw the beauty of nature and he remembered his innocent childhood and those memories and that beauty made him realise there was more to live for. Unfortunately, when the, poet, when the pilot uh, returns home, he's totally shunned. His family acts like he's not there. So what we're going to start off by doing is reading the poem through once all together um, and then we'll break it down into stanza by stanza. Here we go. Kamikaze by Beatrice Garland. Her father embarked at sunrise with a flask of water, a samurai sword in the cockpit, a shaven head full of powerful incantations and enough fuel for a one-way journey into history. But halfway there, she thought, recounting it later to her children, he must have looked far down at the little fishing boat strung out like bunting on a green-blue translucent sea, and beneath them, arching in swathes like a huge flag waved first one way then the other in a figure of eight. The dark shoals of fishes flashing silver as their bellies swivelled towards the sun and remembered how he and his brothers waiting on the shore built cairns of pearl grey pebbles to see whose withstood longest the turbulent inrush of breakers bringing their father's boat safe. Yes, grandfather's boat, safe to the shore, salt sodden, awash with cloud-marked mackerel, black crabs, feathery prawns and the loose silver of white bait, and once a tuna, the dark prince, muscular, dangerous. And though he came back, my mother never spoke again in his presence, nor did she meet his eyes. And the neighbours too, they treated him as though he no longer existed. Only we children still chattered and laughed. Till gradually, we too learned to be silent. To live as though he had never returned. That this was no longer the father we loved. And sometimes, she said, he must have wondered which had been the better way to die. OK, so let's start with stanza one. Um, just remember that I'm going to go through maybe three, maximum four ideas and quotations um, for each stanza. Now, you don't have to get all of these down straight away. Remember, you can come back, listen again um, and, and make those annotations at another time. This lecture is really about you understanding this poem before you come to the lesson. So let's get started with stanza number one. 
Her father embarked at sunrise with a flask of water, a samurai sword in the cockpit, a shaven head full of powerful incantations and enough fuel for a one-way journey into history. I'd like to start off with actually the last line there, a one-way journey into history. I think this is a really haunting phrase and it shows us and tells us how the role of a kamikaze pilot was presented by the army, by the government, as this great honourable um, thing and something to be incredibly proud of. Um, I'm sort of working my way backwards here, but that also makes me, um, and I want to highlight this idea that it is certain death. They, they weren't going to be coming home. They were planning to die. Um, and this is a huge, you know, a metaphor, isn't it? it and it's all, all, almost a euphemism. It's almost subtly and not even really referencing the fact that this would have been a brutal and violent death to crash your plane into into something. Um, and I think it's 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 really interesting how the, the, the power of propaganda here is definitely, definitely highlighted. Remember, we've got the daughter of the kamikaze pilot speaking here and she mentions that um, with a shaven head his head was full of powerful incantations now the noun incantations suggests that the pilot was under some sort of spell really implying the influence of propaganda you know being told that to die for your country is a great great honor that propaganda that we talked about earlier um, the power of that is really quite um, overwhelming here. Interestingly, uh, just a note on the shaved head reference. Soldiers shaved their heads as part of a ritual um, that demonstrated their readiness um, for their mission, um, their readiness for death. Um, but it also signified how um, ready and you know they were very dignified in their death. It was a very proper death. They were ready for it. I also wanted to highlight the reference to sunrise in the opening line. Her father embarked at sunrise. Japan, as some of you may know, um, is known as the land of the rising sun. So this is a reference to the placement of the speaker. Lastly, um, although I've gone backwards, um, the verb embarked. Her father embarked at sunrise. This creates a sense of her father going on a journey but like we see with the euphemism at the end a one-way journey into history very little is suggested about the fact that this journey was a journey towards death it's very subtle Notice, and hopefully you'll notice this throughout this whole poem, the enjambment here, taking us from stanza one to stanza two. Enough fuel for a one-way journey into history, but halfway there, she thought, recounting it later to her children, he must have looked far down at the little fishing boats strung out like bunting on the green, blue, translucent sea. So that enjambment takes us to the second stanza and notice that the poem changes direction just as the plane that the kamikaze pilot was driving, just as the plane changed direction. We also are seeing here um, the daughter's thoughts and reasoning. The pilot's voice and explanations are never ever heard. We hear the daughter we hear her thoughts and that very much links to the shunning in society um you know we we hear um the daughter's voice direct speech all the way all the way through this um and we know that the pilot when he got home was was shunned he wasn't um he was ostracized from society they they people that had turned their back on their mission, they were treated like they, they were not alive. And I think that's very much highlighted through the fact we never hear his voice and we never hear his explanation. 
I really wanted to draw your attention to line 10, the little fishing boats, the strung out like bunting. This is a real image, the bunting reference, an image of homeliness, of celebration. Really ironic as there is no return for the pilot and certainly no celebration when he does return. The little fishing boats, I think that's quite an ironic image as well. The pilot should be aiming for huge warships, um, but it's the little fishing boats that catch his eye. Lastly, the green blue translucent sea. What a beautiful image of nature, really highlighting early on in this poem that it is the beauty of nature that is powerful enough to direct a man committed to his country away from his mission. Okay, so just before we start stanza three, I just want to draw your attention to the use of sibilance in this stanza. And for me, it's really important, it's doing a really important job here, and it's emphasising the power the nature has um, on the pilot. So here we go. Beneath them, arching in swathes like a huge flag waved first one way, then the other in a figure of eight, the dark shoals of fishes flashing silver as their bellies swivelled towards the sun. So that sibilant sound at the latter end of this stanza reflects the smooth movement of the fish through water. It's that image of the fish through water that drags and, and grabs his attention, that reminds him of the beauty of nature beneath him and directs him away from his mission. The flashing silver, that movement, the verb flashing, hints at the movement of the samurai sword in line two. Ironic, as um, the pilot is actually about to turn away from conflict rather than head towards it. But equally, the flashing silver, the reference to the sam samurai sword possibly, could also symbolise him sealing his fate as dead to everyone he loves. As soon as he sees these images of nature, he turns around, he turns away from his mission. So it's almost as if he uses his samurai sword because by the time he gets home, he's treated as if he is dead. So just before we read stanza four, um, I'd just like to highlight how this stanza, the focus shifts and the focus shifts here to the pilot's childhood memories. I think Garland, the poet, is highlighting to us the power of memory, how the, our memories have got the ability to shape who we are as adults and they have got the ability to shape our futures. The focus, um, as we just said, switches uh, to the childhood memories of the pilot and those very innocent childhood activities. We see him in this stanza building um, sort of towers of pearl grey pebbles and playing in the sea with his brother. And those really childhood, um, those childhood activities, childhood memories really contrasting with the conflict of war. Yet again, we've got the um, evidence of enjambment here in this stanza, the lack of punctuation as well, really hints that the pilot just gets so caught up in those memories and that's what drives him back home. Okay, so I'm going to just quickly briefly talk about stanza five and six um, for a moment. And at this stage in the, um, in the poem, we see in the italics the little aside that the daughter um, speaks. Um, throughout the poem, you will see towards the end here that we do see quite a bit of the poem in italics. And that's where we see the daughter's direct speech. OK, so everywhere you see that it's in italics, that's her actually speaking. All right. Um, and here she goes, yes, grandfather's boat. The fact that he's a grandfather means he he did come back home and um, you know, his family was building and his family have built their own history. Um, but that's a history that he's not a part of because he's just so ostracised from the society. So, yes, grandfather's boat, safe. 
We see that repetition of safe used in line 24 in the earlier stanza too. And that repetition hints that the pilot doesn't want the children to go through the pain of losing him. He didn't he didn't want his his family and his young children to suffer loss. He wanted to share their lives with them. We see the narrator's voice here interject. Um, so that's what I was just talking about, about the italics. The voice um, of the daughter in the poem makes it really clear that this is written from her perspective. We see the descriptions of the cloud marked mackerel, the black crabs, feathery prawns, the loose silver of white bait and once a tuna, the dark prince, muscular and dangerous. The descriptions make the sea creatures seem precious, seem beautiful seem powerful. We also see the first full stop at the end of this stanza signifying the end of flight. Well, what should have been a flight that ended in death, but we know this flight ends in a return to a family that he is eventually ostracised from. It's really interesting to think about what Garland's message is here. This is a man that has chosen life and chosen family and chosen a future. But by doing so, he's treated as if he has died. So I truly believe that she's getting us to question the power of propaganda, the power of duty and the duty that men felt, certainly if we're talking about Second World War, but the duty of soldiers. And what makes people want to give their life for their country? What drives people to do that? So in stanza six, um, we hear the daughter's voice in direct speech again. Notice it's in italics. So this is all her direct speech, talking to her children, talking to her father's grandchildren even though they don't know him. She's having to tell them stories about him because they don't know him. I think it's really interesting that we hear from a daughter, very similarly to our previous study of poppies, where um, Jane Weir gives the mother the voice. Here we get the voice of a daughter, a daughter that didn't choose for her father to go to war, didn't choose to be part of a conflict. Um, but I think it's really interesting, doesn't it? Isn't it? Because we get the we get to understand the impact of war on people who aren't involved in it. And that's been a recurring theme in quite a few of our poems in War Photographer, um, in Poppies and now again in Kamikaze. So here stands a six um, as before. We don't really get much description. It's very factual, but we do understand that she felt pain. She felt empathy with her father. She says, and though he came back, my mother never spoke again in his presence, nor did she meet his eyes and the neighbours too. They treated him as though he no longer existed. Only we children still chattered and laughed very ironic isn't it that even though this man came home he is dead and treated as if he is dead despite having survived so stanza seven then um we see that even as a child even though her father comes home as a daughter that she too learned to ignore him and I get the impression that she has a tinge of regret for her actions she starts the last stanza by saying till gradually we too learned to be silent to live as though he had never returned that this was no longer the father we loved and sometimes she said he must have wondered which had been the better way to die so that verb learned. This behaviour wasn't natural to her. It was forced on her. 
She had to learn to ignore him, learn to be silent. And I really do understand that sense of regret that she feels there. We get the impression that her father was changed by his experience. She says he was no longer the father we loved. Is that a sign that he suffered when he came home? Like some of our other characters in previous poems we've studied, is this an indication that he suffered from PTSD? Um, is that that the emotional state of a man that regrets his decision felt he should have continued and regrets turning home and coming back? But also, this could just be a, um, his perception, people, how people perceived him. He's now no longer that man that we honoured, that we believe to be the bravest of all. He isn't any of those things anymore because he returned home. He failed his mission. For me, the final sentence displays how destructive patriotism can be. We talked about this earlier and I think this really does underline the poet's message, the power of patriotism, but how destructive it can be. Either way, he acted as a kamikaze pilot. His story ends in death. But unfortunately for this man, that was not an honourable death. It was dishonourable. I'd just like to, just before I finish with this stanza, just highlight to you the repetition of he must have. Here, he must have wondered. But it's also used again in line nine. And I think this reflects the daughter's feelings towards her father, although she learned to ignore him. She's always loved him. And I think she does respect him. She certainly respects him enough and loves him enough to be retelling his story to her grandchildren so that his memory lives on even though he does not. So here year 10 you'll see there are some additional tasks um, and some additional questions that you might want to use if ever you are reading this or, or listening to this lecture for revision purposes. Reminder, if you're listening to this lecture ahead of your lesson, then you don't have to spend time doing this. A lot of these questions we'll cover in class. But if you are listening to this um, and you're revising or you're doing some additional work to help boost your knowledge or um, work on an exam question, then please do uh, use these tasks to help you um, with any of that.